Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so it's about the ideal CSV template. So my name is Roger Fisher. Uh, I'm working on a project called Data Map, and we focus right now on elections worldwide. Um, we mapped the U.S. We mapped the U.S. Um, in different ways: electoral college, states, counties. And we also started uh, working on the counties themselves, on the precinct maps for the counties. This is uh, Amador in California, for example. Uh, this is Jackson, Michigan. And this is where I live in Berkeley, um, Alameda County. So blue is Democrat, for Democrats, obviously, and the red part is for, um, for Donald Trump. And the problem was, while we were working on this, um, we encountered many, many problems because there is so much variety. And so we, more and more, we uh, went to the point where we said, well, this is kind of a big thing, much bigger than we thought at the beginning. We just wanted to map uh, some stuff, I mean, some data. And so we call this now the election project or the LAP, and we, the, the format uh, is uh, CSV. And we thought about a kind of a system of modules where we have the election results, um, maps, that's what we're doing right now, but also uh, some more um, experimental stuff like color schemes and political positioning, uh, candidates, parties, uh, I mean, money, uh, in regards to candidates, for example, uh, uh, something the Federal Election Commission does, uh, also hardware vendors, voting hardware vendors, and stuff like that. So uh, it's also, next to the modules, it's also a way of how to work with data, basically how, how to name data, and we kind of coined some terms like raw, ext for external data, then the data, when it comes together with the map, uh, the data when it's transformed. Um, and I will explain that uh, with an example. So the idea is to have a standard way of accomplishing things so that you can talk about it. And yeah, it should be easy <laughs> to compare election data over time and space. That was what we really wanted to do. And it's not. And the problem is, especially for county data, it's really hard to find the data. You have to uh, search for every county. Um, uh, also, on the, uh, for, for some countries, it's easy, like France. You have it in the night of the elections. You don't have exit polls. But in other countries, like the US, it's the official data comes um, two months later, basically. And I think that's really a big problem in the US because this kind of Trump saying there is election fraud, this comes because we don't have this data in the open. It's not published. It's not, nobody sees it. There are maps all over the place, but these maps are most often incorrect. Uh, so even the New York Times had a map that was incorrect for about three months. Um, and many publications have still maps online, um, or people who work with data have maps that are incorrect. So I think that really has to change. So the focus of this talk is to have um, some names so that we really know uh, about what we are talking, uh, which we call the minimal set, and then some issues like write-ins, which are really tricky, the residual vote, um, and then the process, and then also percentages which you need to encode color, and then some mapping issues. And at the end, um, something more experimental, which is colors and positioning, and the idea of a global color scheme. So make the implicit explicit, that's the idea of the minimal set. So it's very, a few terms, but these terms, we have to get them right 
and interestingly, they change and or people use them differently. So we have in the US mostly registered voters um, or we have only registered voters. In other countries, we have eligible voters. So the difference is basically in a country like the Netherlands, everyone can vote, which is 18, more or less, like 56 people can't. So they are eligible voters. Uh, in the US, you have to register to vote. And so it's a much smaller portion of people. Ballots cast, that's really when people vote. Uh, the ballots they send in, I mean, if they're ele electronic or in paper. Um, so that's all the votes, the total votes, if you want. And the turnout is the ballots cast divided by registered times 100. And then sometimes you also encounter kind of turnout for eligible voters, turnout voting age. So that's uh, often something you can see um, because you want to know how few people basically voted in an election. And in the US, that can go down to 30% or 35% in some states. And when you have turnout registered, that all looks much prettier. So you could have 70% turnout with the registered voters, but only 30, 35% turnout voting age. And the next thing that's really important, I think, and gets overlooked a lot, is ballots cast. You have valid votes and you have a residual vote. And the residual vote is all the invalid votes that are blank votes, over votes, under votes, all that stuff. And yeah, that's the residual vote. I will get to an example for Florida is something that can be very, uh, really interesting to track. So tricky, the writings are really tricky because it changes from state to state. So you have states where every, one, every writing is a valid vote. So basically someone can win the vote if, um, if there are enough people voted this writing in. Then you have the ones you have to be official write-ins, uh, and then you have other states where you can't have any write-ins, only official candidates. And so in Florida, for example, uh, you really needed to know which ones are the official write-ins. Uh, if you would vote for them, that they would count. And uh, if you would uh, take Bernie Sanders, that would be an invalid vote. So we have to differentiate that um, when we count that right in either in the valid or in the residual vote. And now to the residual, Florida, um, which is a state which is super important for in every election. Basically, it can decide the election. Uh, this time, the difference between Trump and Clinton was 112,911 votes. And we already know about 1.6 million Florida residents are barred from voting. So uh, already there, um, a huge part of people who can't vote. And suddenly we also see, um, and that's the official document from Florida, the residual vote um, jumps from 0.75% to 1.69% from 2012 to 2016. Interestingly, um, the paper which talks about this from the Florida Election Com Commission only operates with percentages, and it's really easy to get the numbers. So, and they say the reason for this is because we had um, um, mail, the mail vote basically uh, is responsible for this increase. And then I thought, well, let's look and make a comparison with another country and the, uh, the, the Dutch elections came up as well. And so I just took the numbers from the Dutch because they pretty much fit with, Flor with the Florida case. So, we have um, about 12 million, 860, 90,000 um, eligible or registered voters for Florida. And uh, we have only, if you go down to the 
residual, residual um, that's like the third block, residual equals votes, and you see that Florida jumped from 64,000 85 to 160,450, whereas the Netherlands have only 47,415 uh, residual vote. So the difference, if you subtract the Dutch vote, residual vote, from the 2016 Florida vote, is 113,035. And that's higher still than the margin. So I find that really um, problematic. And also if I see up there uh, basically the difference uh, from basically almost the same amount of people vote, but one country is 3.5 million, uh, has, uh, has a population that is 3.5 million higher. So uh, I think it's really worse to see these numbers and that's something we don't see if we don't have the name for it, the residual vote. So, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Yosemite and I was like, well, we, we do all these maps and how did Yosemite National Park vote? That could be interesting. I knew it's, uh, I mean, I already knew that it's a Republican county, uh, even though it's in California, but people voted Republican. But I wanted to know, um, just a national park, is that also Republican dominated or is it maybe the precinct is different? So when we encounter uh, raw election data, we have the good, we have C uh, so people who already use CSV, text, Excel. We have the bad, that's PDFs, but they're still extractable with Tabula, for example, and we have the ugly, basically a photo as a PDF. So a photo of the, of the data, and you can't extract it. So the only way of doing that is by hand. So far, unless someone comes up with an idea how to do this with machine learning, kind of very <laughs> intelligent uh, way of doing that. So in Mariposa County, where um, Yosemite National Park is located, uh, that looked like this at first. Um, so, and then we went from the raw, so we call this the raw. We went from this, uh, we brought it to CSV, we cleaned it, one header, no void lines. We re reduced it so all the, um, the Mail votes, we brought, uh, we brought them together with the election day votes. You can also separate them, but in this case, we, we bring them together. We structure it along the minimal set. We use the wide format, uh, if you know, like tidy data from Hadley Wickham, um, where the long format is used, to, but we use the wide format be because we want to map it afterwards. So we went to this and then further down to this. And so you see registered, ballots cast, turnout, valid, Stein, Clinton, residual. Very simple. And then we bring it together with, with kind of the, the, the map um, part. This is the map part, which we call the ref. The X part again. And then we have all the data together. So that's, that's the process, basically. And now we still, it's still impossible to map that. So we need further data transformations. And there again, we have a problem. So we want to normalize to, to basically color uh, the map. We need to normalize the data and have percentages. And so what percentages? Is it candidates, ballots cast? Um, is it, is it uh, can, candidate divided by, by valid? And so I looked at maps and I looked again at Florida and checked newspapers. Um, so the, in Florida, officially it's 49%. Uh, the New York Times has 48.6%. Uh, Cook has 49%. I think this is Politico or CNN. They have even, and that was like two weeks ago, 40.6%. 40, uh, 40 
49.1 percent, 40, yeah, so, so you have all kind of data and all kind of percentages. And so we just try to define these things and say, well, it's candidate divided by valid times 100. It's as easy as that and you get to the numbers. But I think it's really worth doing that once for all so that everyone, everyone can follow that. And so basically, yeah, Yosemite um, is democratic precinct in a Republican county. So it's had, uh, Clinton had 67.12% and Trump had 17.81. And then I just go over that. We have some edge cases with maps. Maybe one interesting one is about Beauty County, also in California, which is again a Republican County. Um, you can have some issues where, where you have basically the data for seven, eight precincts in, instead of just one. And so you have to kind of solve this problem too. So now something a little bit more exp experimental uh, in this uh, election project, it's about color. And yeah, all entities move and nothing remains still. Uh, things change. And so how do you do that with color? How do you have consistency over time? Here you have the Netherlands uh, election 2006, 2010, 2012, and 2017. And you see if you have consistent colors, it's really nice. You can see what's happening. Uh, over time, how parties kind of fade away New parties come, take over, and uh, or uh, some parties can come up or go back. Um, and yeah, uh, with we also do things like color scales in four countries. Um, then you have even so you have even more a problem with with color because you have uh, if you have more parties and you want to also show the differences, uh, you even need more colors. And, and the problem was, could you, I mean, if you're not from the Netherlands, could you read uh, this map or could you read this, uh, these maps here, these uh, French maps? They are all the same, but basically you don't know which party is what. And so we thought it would be really interesting to have a kind of a global color space um, where we have like left, right, progressive, conservative, so that's one idea here, a more sub subjective one here, and just go over that. And if we combine that with this compass idea, like here, uh, and we see also how parties change, uh, we could color our maps in a better way. And we could probably see some things better than before. So I found the part Trump, Wilders, Le Pen, they're all in this dark conservative part, really interesting. And here also um, another one where you see basically uh, the, um, a prediction what would happen with the Democratic and Repo Republican Party and what really happened. And here also, I mean, obviously there are also people who po uh, put politicians differently in this color space. So yeah, that was it. Um, just a, uh, a quick recap. The ALEP, uh, the election project is a set of modules. We looked at election, election results at the precinct level, the stages from raw to exed from data to the map, the minimal set, which really tries to define things very, very clearly so that we can use them everywhere in the world, and then some more ex, uh, experimental features, uh, general global political color space, so that everyone can see when he looks at the map what's really happening and also what's happening over time. 
with a compass uh, nearby to position candidates and to see how they change. Thanks.